Many of us uh, have wondered from afar how Israel has achieved uh, the military uh, technological uh, leadership in the world uh, and power that it has. And many of us have hoped from afar uh, that it can continue to sustain this military edge in what is an ever-present uh, set of dangers and challenges uh, that Israel faces. Well, finally, we have the book, and an important book, that gives us an account of how this happened, why it happened, who made it happen, and why it really matters. Uh, I'm really privileged uh, to be joined tonight with Yaakov Katz. Uh, Yaakov is the editor, a recent, relatively recent. Ten months. Yeah, uh, that's still recent. Yes. Um, editor of the Jerusalem Post. Uh, he was for many years, uh, close to a decade, uh, their military reporter and chief defense analyst. Uh, he wrote another book before this called Israel versus Iran, the Shadow War. He spent some time both at Harvard University and in the Israeli government. You can ask him later which of those institutions tested his sanity more. Um, uh, and, and now he's returned to his true vocation as a journalist, as an editor. Uh, and as an author uh, of this important book. As you came to understand it, what really explains the Israeli achievement and the Israeli difference? How did it become, this tiny little nation, such a unique and powerful military nation? Well, first of all, I just want to say um, a big thank you to Eric and to the chairman of the Tikva Fund, uh, Roger Hertog, and to all of you for being here this evening and for coming. I, I appreciate it. I know you could be doing something uh, else, so it means a lot to me that you're out here. I think that when you look at the Israeli story, Israel is unique for a number of reasons. But when I, when I look at the big picture, right, I always take a, a look at how um, it's a, an ancient people that returned to their historic homeland and established a state against all odds. And when you think about it in that way, the fact that they came with no resources, they had no money, there was no oil as opposed to, let's say, some of their neighbors in the Arab countries. There was no money, there were no weapons to talk of. And they had only one resource that was to their advantage, and that was the Jewish brain. That was the, the fact that they could think, and they could think out of the box. So I think that when you, when you look at it with the terms of the brains that they had, when your back is up against the wall, you had no alternative, no choice but to innovate. When the, sh the shadow of the guillotine is the man who invented the, uh, who came up with the idea to launch and develop an Israeli satellite said to me, the shadow of the guillotine sharpens the mind. And I think that that very much is the Israel story to a large extent when it comes to the weapons and the military technology that Israel has created. Now with that said, there's obviously a lot of practical pieces that come into play. For example, 4.5% of Israel's GDP goes to research and development, to R&D. Out of that, 30% is of, a, of products of a military nature. Now if you compare that to Germany, to America, to other countries around the world, just a fraction of their R&D budget is going to military products. While in Israel you have a massive investment, you look at the percentage of the, f the, the defense budget. Now we could talk a lot about that, but I really like to go back to the cultural characteristics, which is one of, when you think about Jews, you think about chutzpah, you think about informality, you think about the Israeli military, which is supposed to, you would think, a military is supposed to embed within you a sense of discipline and hierarchy and structure. Well, it's the complete opposite in Israel. We don't salute our commanding officers. The brass on their shoulders mean nothing. We talk back to them. We have a ceremony in the Israeli military we call breaking the distance, right? I remember when I was a, uh, a young soldier in basic training. It was the heat of August. We were uh, doing basic training near Ash Ashdod, so it was along the beach. The, the flies were driving me insane, but we weren't allowed to wear sunglasses because then we had what was called distance with our commanders. You couldn't talk to a commander when you were wearing sunglasses. But then two weeks in, suddenly we have this thing called shvirat distance, a ceremony to break the distance. Now that's insane. You have a military that's supposed to create discipline but breaks that distance and breaks down the hierarchical structure that you're supposed to have in a military. So you have a lot of these different characteristics that I think is what creates that secret sauce and that recipe that gives Israel this advantage. The book is really a story, or a story of stories, of these dramatic weapons developments, and most importantly, the figures, often heroic figures, creative, persistent, who drove these developments. Uh, so I thought maybe you could just tell some of these stories as you do in the book, perhaps beginning with one of the early ones, the story of the bullet factory gets you right at the beginning uh, of the founding uh, period of Israel. So what's that story? 
I, I think you're right. You know, what, and, uh, before I answer that question specifically, Amir and I, my co-author, are both, we were both veteran military reporters. We have been covering the Israeli military, I'd say for the large part of the last 15 years or so. So that includes the second intifada with the uprising in 2000, the pullout from Gaza in 2005, the second Lebanon war of 2006, and all of the operations in Gaza, cast lead, pillar of defense, protective edge, you name it. But when you get so caught up in the day-to-day -day operations, missions, and the routine, you tend to forget the people who are behind all this. And one of the things we discovered through our daily coverage was that the, there are these fascinating people that aren't getting attention and that no one's hearing about who are really these unsung heroes of Israel's technological uh, mir miracle and story. So you talk about the bullet factory. So if we go back to pre-state, pre, pre um, Israel, didn't have any bullets. Israel didn't have any weapons. And I, we, if I connect two different stories, so Shimon Peres found himself, uh, before the state was established, in the Red House. It's a building in Tel Aviv where the Haganah had its headquarters. And he didn't know what he was supposed to do. He had been sent there by his kibbutz to come and try to help with the war effort. This is even before the state had been established. He meets Ben-Gurion, who he had known through some party politicking. And then he said, go sit in that office over there. That's the chief of staff's office. He's out sick. He's not around. And he goes in the office, and Shimon Peres, a unique character, starts to rummage through the drawers. And he opens up one drawer and finds a letter that's written to Ben-Gurion. He opens up this letter. And it's a letter written by another general who had been offered the position to serve as the chief of staff of the soon-to-be-found state. And this general says to uh, the soon-to-be prime minister, Ben-Gurion, I have to politely decline your offer to serve as chief of staff. Why? Because I've discovered that we only have six million bullets in our arsenal. And according to my calculations, we'll need about a million bullets a day to fight a war. And I'm not willing to be chief of staff for just six days. So that was the dire situation that Israel found itself on the eve of the Independence War of 1948. Now, go back to the story of the bullet factory. They basically created a fake kibbutz outside of Rehovot, built a laundromat. Under this laundromat, they built a bullet factory with an entrance from the laundromat, another entrance from a bakery. And in there, they had these sun, lamp, sun uh, you know, type of lights that could get, make it seem as if the people were actually working out in the fields during the day. And this was the way that they created bullets. They had a special bullet that uh, was made at the Ayalon Institute. That was the name of it, Mahon Ayalon. And these were the bullets that were used when the 48 war broke out. So how did they move from an underground bullet factory to building an air force? I mean, that, that, that's a great question, because I think it was, it was something that was gradual. It wasn't as if one day you woke up and you said, OK, now I have this, I can have that. You have to remember also that after the 48 war, which was a miracle in of itself that Israel survived, right? Who would have thought five Arab armies converging on this nascent Jewish state and they're able to survive and establish a state. But then they had to get their hands on weapons. And there was the tri-party declaration. No, none of the big superpowers were willing to sell weapons to the Middle East because everyone said, hands off. We don't want to destabilize the region. Everyone was neutral back then, right? Neutrality, I guess, is a good thing sometimes. But Israel had to go get its hands on weapons. And they embarked on a series of different shopping sprees around the world. You had Back to Paris, as an example, finds himself in a Havana nightclub at midnight negotiating with some Cuban guys over cigars and drinks and watching the young ladies dance um, and buying weapons from the Cubans. You had stories of people who were sent to the UK and created a fake production company that they said were going to make a World War II movie and they bought airplanes that they could use in the production. The airplanes take off and instead of flying for the movie, they start flying to the southeast towards Palestine. So you had a lot of these different escapades, this gung-ho culture, I think, that really took part and control of the Israel story at the time. But the Air Force was something that happened gradual. And Eventually, if we fast forward to the 1950s, Israel was able to establish strategic ties with France. France at the time became Israel's main supplier of weapons. 
it was Israel's main ally. This was a time when the United States was not selling weapons to Israel, which is something that we find hard to even remember or comprehend in today's political environment with the close alliance that Israel enjoys with the United States. But then it was France, and Israel was able to get its hands on some of the most sophisticated aircraft with the Mirage and others that were able to give Israel this qualitative uh, aerial superiority. So let's maybe look at some of the very modern, uh, as we see it, uh, technologies where Israel has asserted a kind of world leadership position, um, beginning maybe with drones. I mean, how did Israel become such an important player in the development of drone technology? And as it's played out today, where do drones fit into Israeli strategy, Israeli defense, uh, Israeli's you know, way of managing its situation in the Middle East? That's a great question. I'll take you back in time for a moment to 1968. So we're after the Six Day War. Israel triples in size, right? Israel conquers the Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank. But it finds itself in a very difficult situation along the Suez Canal, right? We're on one side, the Egyptians are on the other side. Now, how do we know that Egypt is not preparing for another war? So they come up with all these different ideas. They say, we'll take aircraft, we'll fly them high altitudes. We can't fly over Egypt because that would be an act of war. That would be violating Egyptian airspace. So they fly within Israeli airspace, but they have to fly high because of Egyptian air, uh, surface to air missile systems. And they fly on these angles and they try to take some photos. They don't come out good. Then one guy comes up with an idea. We'll build a tower on a tank and we'll peer over the border, over the Suez, which isn't that wide, right? Until one day an Egyptian sniper takes a shot at one of these towers and hurts a soldier and they say, that's not a good idea. They come up with the idea. We'll take a spy, send him off to Europe, from Europe to Cairo. Cairo will make his way up to the, the Sinai, take some photos, go back to Cairo, fly back to Europe, make his way back to Israel, develop the film and we'll have these photos. And one day, the spy finally comes back. They're all gathering in military intelligence headquarters in Tel Aviv. And there was one officer there, and like a lot of the chapters that we write about, a lot of the technologies, there's always this one guy who we find who comes up with, who has this epiphany, who says, this is crazy. To what length we're going to just see what's happening 50 yards across the Suez Canal? It doesn't make sense. And then he remembers that he had seen a movie. I'm told that back in those times, there was a newsreel before the feature film. This was before my day. <laughs> Some of you might remember. Um, he remembers seeing a newsreel at a film in Tel Aviv where uh, it had showed before the feature film a Jewish kid here in America who had a bar mitzvah. And at his bar mitzvah, he got a toy airplane. Make a long story short, someone from the Israeli consulate, now on 42nd and 2nd, I don't know if it was there then, goes to a toy store here in New York City, buys three toy airplanes, a couple of spare tires and propellers, sends them back to Israel in a diplomatic pouch. They attach a camera to the belly. And then in 1969, July of 1969, they fly the first of these toy airplanes over the Suez Canal. And they take amazing photos. This was the first drone in history, a toy airplane. Now, the story doesn't necessarily have a great ending because then Israel decided, okay, we have to build our own new platform. We have to build an aircraft that kept on crashing, didn't work. Drones get tanked, and the Yom Kippur War breaks out. But right after the Yom Kippur War and that bloody debacle, they restart this program. And already in 1982, Israel is the first, one of the first countries to have operational drones. I'll take it in 1983, America found itself without having any way of doing reconnaissance in Lebanon, where it was facing off against Syrian surface air missile systems. The Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, flies down to Israel, sees our drones, and decides to buy them. The first operational drones here in the United States was a drone, a spin-off of the Scout, that was the Israeli drone, called the Pioneer, made by Tassia Virit, Israel Aerospace Industries in Israel. So, but why drones, right? I think that if you look at where Israel succeeds and excels, we don't make big things. The one exception is the Merkava tank. And that was really because we found ourselves under embargo without the ability to buy from anyone. But when you look at aircraft, we buy that here in the United States. We used to buy that from the French. The ships, we get the submarines now from Germany. We get our main, our, our battleships from uh, either Germany or the United States. But when it comes to small platforms, that's where Israel excels. So drones, satellites, cyber technology, intelligence gathering systems, those types of sensors, that's where Israel has that edge. Now, where, how do drones fit into this? If you look at the flight hours today of the Israeli Air Force, there is never a moment, a minute, 
that there is not at least one or if not more drones that are somewhere along Israel's borders gathering intelligence and doing recon work, whether it's in Gaza, Lebanon, or other places throughout the region. Drones today take up the majority of flight hours in the Air Force. So I want to come back to some of those other technologies, um, but I want to ask you, when you call Israel a military superpower, what do you really say? Is it one of the world's military superpowers? Or is it just at the cutting edge of certain military technologies, an impressive army and military force given its size, but you really see it as a superpower? I see it as a superpower. I think that when I think of Israel and I think of its power that it can uh, radiate and project throughout the region, I think that Israel's strategic deterrence and standing rests on three main pillars. The first is the conventional military that Israel has, the IDF, right? the Israel Defense Forces, and a lot of that is the technology that we write about. The second pillar is the purported nuclear capability that Israel has or it doesn't have. You can read all about it online in Google. And the third is, I think, today our strategic alliance with the United States, which provides Israel with this diplomatic clout that it can leverage throughout the world. But when I talk about a military superpower, the way I look at it is, we, we are fewer in numbers when it comes to the Egyptian military. We have less tanks when it comes to the Syrian military. But ours are better. Ours are technologically superior. And that qualitative military edge gives you a power that your adversaries don't have. Now, add to that the fact that Israel's tactics and technology are changing the modern battlefield, are changing the way wars are fought. Talk about drones, right? Targeted assassinations and killings. This goes back to the biblical time, right? When, when people were getting knocked off in different ways. But Israel in the second intifada started to use this, this uh, tactic of targeted assassinations against terrorists that couldn't get their hands on in places like Gaza. That today is the global standard for the war on terror. Barack Obama, for all the criticism we might have of him, his disengagement from the Middle East, which, trust me, we have lots of criticism, but he took that policy, that tactic, to a scale that had never been done here in the United States before, doing targeted killings around, uh, around the world and particularly within the Middle East. So I think that when you look at the technology plus the tactics and the changes, that the revolution that this is taking place throughout the way the wars are being fought, the fact that countries around the world are looking to Israel to learn our tactics, our skills, our use, want our technology, because they're facing now, they're beginning to understand the challenges we face, I look at that as a superpower. So what's the story of Iron Dome? both how it came about and where it fits in terms of in shaping Israel's military and political strategy. Iron Dome is a, which you're probably all familiar with, is the rocket, missile, rocket defense system that can shoot down and intercept short range rockets, which are basically the backbone of the arsenal that Hamas has in Gaza, Hezbollah has in Lebanon. Hezbollah now has about 130,000 rockets. Hamas has a few tens of thousands. But what the Iron Dome really came to do, it's imagine a bullet shooting down a bullet, right? It's, it's almost ridiculous. But Israel had already had at the time the Arrow, which was able to intercept ballistic missiles, which are of a longer range and farther distances, but there it's slightly e more easier. Here the time is so short, right? You just have a few seconds. But the way Iron Dome, and without getting too much in the tech, into the technical aspect of it, it came from uh, one or two people, one in particular, who decided that it was possible to push through this technology even when he was told no, even without money, even without budgets, to the extent that we tell a story here of how this officer goes ahead and talks to a, and I still don't have the name of this person, but some hedge fund manager here in, in America, and says to him, I might need you to give me $50 million. Now can you imagine an Israeli Air Force officer coming to an American businessman and saying, I might need you to front me $50 million so I can develop a weapon system in Israel. Now, I mean, this is against all rules and regulations, right? And this, this officer was censored by the state comptroller. He violated different rules and laws. But this ultimately led to the fact that Israel today has a system with an 85, almost 90% success rate. Now, how does missile defense fit into it? So there are those who would be critical of missile defense. They say that's not how you win a war. You win a war with offensive capabilities. You strike back at your enemy. You don't defend yourself. I tend to look at it from a different angle. 
and I think maybe this is the right angle. The missile defense systems that Israel has create what I like to call diplomatic maneuverability. Right? It's basically the ability, think of these Qassam rockets, if they, and Katusha rockets, if they fired thousands of them and we don't have this system, you as the government, if you're Netanyahu, if you're Avigdor Lieberman, the defense minister today, any rocket that's fired, or just a few dozen, become a strategic threat. You have to respond. People get killed, your response comes from the gut. You have no choice but to find yourself back inside Gaza, potentially conquering all of the Gaza Strip. What the Iron Dome gives you is the ability to take a deep breath, to sit back for a moment and say, hold on a second, what's the right response? Now we might disagree. The right response still might be to go invade and conquer. But it gives you this time and opportunity to think, which is extremely valuable at times of crisis and war. So I think that when you look at how it fits into the overall kind of military doctrine, that's how it fits in, that diplomatic maneuverability it provides. So one of the, the overarching themes of the book is that the way Israel became this military superpower, uh, this technological innovator, is it has this uniquely entrepreneurial culture. It adapts, it invents, it solves problems in indirect ways, it breaks the rules. Um, but you could also read this as the opposite, that these innovators are breaking rules, being innovative, finding indirect solutions, in part because there is a bureaucratic culture within the Israeli military that opposes them. I mean, many of these are stories where people said yes and were persistent in the face of no's, more conventional thinking, more hierarchical thinking. So how do these two cultures within Israel interact with each other? And how do you see this playing out in shaping the future of Israeli innovation? It's a great question. We have, unfortunately, a lot of bureaucracy in Israel. You know, if you look at the, uh, I think there's this ranking for ease of doing business around the world, right? We, we always rank quite low, which is not good for Israel. People who want to come and invest in, in the Israeli economy, in Israeli industry, in Israeli high tech, that doesn't speak well of us. But I think that here what you see is this entrepreneurial culture and characteristic is something that breaks through those barriers and tries to succeed even when there are rules and regulations against you. Now it's, it's, it's a game and, it, and it's, it's a balance, but I think that what makes Israel unique is that the culture allows this. Society tolerates it. it in fact, it encourages it. And that's what makes Israel, that's what gives Israel this ability to succeed. I, there's one story we tell here about uh, this General Ron Kadish, even despite his name, he's not Jewish, but he was the, he's a lieutenant general, a two-star general. He was the head of the Missile Defense Agency here in the United States. But back in the 1990s, he was the head of the F-16 program. And then in the 90s, there were a lot of problems with some of the F-16s. They were crashing, they were spinning out of control, and outside of the U.S., Israel had the largest fleet of F-16s. So he flew to Israel, and he goes to Tel Nof Air Force Base, meets there with the one-star general, the Br brigadier general, the commander of the, of the base, takes him around, shows him the aircraft. Some of, them, some of the Israeli F-16s had the kill marks. They had been used in operations in Lebanon, and they had been used to bomb the Osirak reactor in 1981 in Iraq. And then they go into the conference room, and they start to have this discussion. And then in the corner of the room, suddenly in Hebrew, this guy starts yelling at the base commander. And Kaddish says to the guy next to him, who is that guy? And it turns out he's a non-commissioned officer, some low-level mechanic who's yelling at his base commander, a one-star general. And Kaddish says to me, I sat there dumbfounded, struck. I was in shock. How dare a mechanic yell at a general? In America, this would never happen. But I think that that is what, that, that ability, that free flow of information, that exchange of ideas is what gives Israel this advantage. Now, you know, the culture that we have, think about it, we got Bibi, we got Bogi, who is our former defense minister, we got Ruby, who's our president, we got Bougie, who's our head of opposition. Everyone's got a nickname in Israel. You know, I'm just Yaakov, right? But um, th th this informality, there's no, you know, you used to, you talk about six degrees of separation, seven degrees of separation. In Israel, there's no separation. The fact that I serve in the army, and then I go and I work in a uh, aerospace company or I become an engineer somewhere. I know what the needs are because I was on the battlefields of Lebanon. I was walking through the narrow alleyways of Nablus on an operation, and I know that, oh, you know, we could actually use a drone that could take off vertically because we won't have a runway there and it can just see what's happening over the side of the wall. And that's how they invented one of the drones called Panther. So there were people like this that 
they go back and forth. They have these dual identities, which is a unique asset, a national asset that I don't think you can find anywhere else. So as you think about the last few decades, how has military technology shaped the America-Israel relationship? It's shaped it in a way, I think, that is created a mutual dependence on one another to some extent, right? Israeli drones are flown by America. If you go back to Afghanistan just a few years ago, you had five NATO countries that were flying Israeli drones. And you have this intelligence sharing that goes on today in an unprecedented way. So I think that while Israel is often looked at as the recipient of the U.S. aid, and now we're going to be getting soon $3.8 billion in a deal that Netanyahu signed with President Obama, now it's still $3 billion, but that's money that allows Israel, that's is money that Israel has to spend here. And that's what Israel uses to buy, for example, the F-35, the Joint Strike Fighter. But when it comes to some of the other technology that Israel has, such as we write about Stuxnet as an example, this cyber warfare, this virus that was used to take out, to some extent, Iran's main uranium enrichment facility. That was a joint operation between the NSA here in the United States and Israel's unit A200. That's Israel's main signal intelligence unit, the equivalent of the NSA in Israel. That cooperation, a lot of it happens behind the scenes. But I think that the Israeli tech, the Israeli know-how, and really the boots on the ground in Israel give it this advantage and give it this, this unique standing that America also needs to rely on Israel for a lot of that help. So as you look ahead to the future, do you have a clear view of what the next wave of military technology innovation might be? And do you worry that Israel's edge might at some point be nullified if offensive weapons, weapons of destruction, become more advanced, easier to produce, more readily available, so that Iron Dome type strategies just can't work, where they'll just become an imbalance between offensive capabilities that spread around the world and Israel's capacity to defend itself or to assert some measure of sovereignty and control within this very volatile region. There is an arms race that's taking place as we speak throughout the Middle East. And it's an arms race that has potentially dire consequences for Israel. You know, when, when Iron Dome was developed, people said this will stop Hamas and Hezbollah from even obtaining these rockets. They won't need them because we'll be able to shoot them out of the sky so they won't be effective. But they keep on accumulating. They keep on getting them. And they think of other ways. If they can't shoot, they'll go underground. If they won't be able to go underground, they'll come up with new ideas. But take drones as an example. Israel invented drones. Today, Hezbollah has its own drones. They flew them into Israel on a number of occasions. On one occasion, one drone got not so close, but close enough to Dimona, to where Israel's nuclear reactor is located when it was shot down by an Israeli Air Force jet. Hamas recently, about a year ago, year and a half ago, flew a drone from Gaza into Israel. Now, does that mean that their drones are as sophisticated as ours? Of course not. But that race takes place. That race is happening. Saudi Arabia has F-15s. They can just pop one up over the Gulf of Aqaba. And they have the ability with standoff JDAMs. They have joint direct attack munitions. These are GPS-guided uh, missiles. They could strike inside Israel, potentially. So when you look at what's happening throughout the region, this is what makes this story so, more, so, much, so far important today. Because it's a constant race, and you constantly have to try to be one step ahead of your enemy. Take, you know, we look at missile defense. Israel recently rolled out Arrow 3. It was delivered to the Air Force. So Israel has uh, Iron Dome for short range, David Sling for the medium range rockets, Arrow 2, and now Arrow 3. Arrow 3 is basically predicting where Iran will be with its ballistic missiles in years to come. You have to be there because you can't wait for them to get the ballistic missiles and then start to develop the, the solution. You have to develop the, the solution before they even get the, the, the missile. So it's a constant arms race. It's, it's a race of the best and brightest on all sides. So how is Israel dealing with who to sell to? Meaning Israel is now a, a cutting edge developer of weapons technology, an exporter of weapons technology. Does it have a clear strategy to how to think about its market? Russia, China, other nations that uh, might be eager for Israeli technology, that have been eager for Israeli technology, and where Israel has to think about how does this affect the America-Israel relationship, and how does it affect the possibility that these, their very own weapons could end up in the hands of their most committed enemies? 
Look, I, I was asked today a similar question about how Israel was in bed back in the day with South Africa and apartheid, and that had to do with uh, the nuclear program, and even South Africa assisted Israel in developing and, and funding some of its uh, missile programs, especially the satellite launch vehicles, which these missiles which were used to put Israeli satellites in space. But let's, let's give it some perspective, right? That was probably bad. But when you think about the fact that this is a country that's just 69 years old, a country that had nothing, no friends, had to develop a lot of it on its own, sometimes you get into bed with the wrong people. Now, they've made mistakes over the years. There was the China fiasco a few years ago. And Israel, since then, for the last uh, 12, 13 years, has not sold a single defense item to China. Because it, there, was a, there was a line that was drawn in the sand by the Bush administration back in 2005, which was either you're with us or you're selling to the Chinese. And Israel decided that it's not going to sell anymore to the Chinese. The Chinese would die to buy Israeli technology, defense technology. But Israel understands that this is a sensitive issue for the United States. When it came to Russia, for example, in 2008, after the war that it fought with Georgia, Russia found that it did not have effective drones. It didn't have its own drones that were usable at a time of war, while the Georgians were using Israeli drones made by an Israeli company called Elbit. Russia came to Israel and said, we want to buy Israeli drones. Now, first of all, that's strange for a number of reasons. But one is the fact that Israel, Russia has never bought any weapons from outside of Russia. Right? But the first country they go to is Israel. That's number one. Number two is, let's remember, it's, those are Russian anti-tank missiles that are being fired by Hezbollah Israeli tanks. Those are Russian anti-tank missiles that are being used by Hamas in the Gaza Strip. So when you know, what goes around comes around, you give Russia drones Next thing you know, it they're in North Korea, Iran, Syria, Gaza. But a debate broke out within the Israeli defense establishment and within the government. And ultimately, they decided to sell Russia drones, older model drones, drones that we no longer use and are no longer operational. Why? Because at the same time, Russia was about to deliver the S-300, one of the most sophisticated air defense systems, to Iran. Now, they've got it already. Fast forward to last year, they suddenly got it. But for five years, by making this deal with the drones, Israel was able to delay the delivery of the S-300 to Iran. So you, you say, there's a trade-off here, right? Is it worth doing it? Is it worth the risk? Is the payoff better? This is, it's a delicate balance. I don't envy the people who sit in those inner security cabinet rooms and have to make those decisions. I, get, I just get to write about them. So I thought we'd spend a few minutes stepping beyond, looking beyond the weapon wizards uh, you know, issues um, in the book and just take advantage of you as editor of the Jerusalem Post with a pretty unique angle of vision on Israeli life. So as you look ahead to the next year, a couple of years, what do you see as likely to be the defining political challenges, whether at home or abroad, that Israel will face? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I think that Israel today my, my personal criticism of Israel, and I'll tie it actually into the book for a moment. You're a disciplined man. Yes, is no, is, you know, we all are familiar with Startup Nation. My book tells the story of innovation when it comes to weapons and military technology. But when I look at Israel today and I look at the, what's our grand vision? What's our strategy? Where are we going? What do we want to do with the Palestinians, as an example? So just this evening, back in Israel, the Knesset approved in a second and third reading this very controversial settlement bill. Now, whether you're in favor of it or you're not, we're all familiar with this, but basically what this bill allows Israel to do is to seize private Palestinian land and basically build their settlements if it decides to, which is something that Israel until now has never done. Because this is likely in violation of international law, the Attorney General, right, of Israel has said he will not be able to defend this in the High Court of Justice, in the Israeli Supreme Court. But despite all that, Israel has passed it. The Likud, Bayit Yehudi, Israel Beitenu, all of the coalition members raised a hand in favor and in support of this. Netanyahu, I don't think, was at the vote because he was just still making his way back from meetings with Theresa May in, uh, in London. But the coalition passed this. Now, you say to yourself, okay, so is, is this where Israel's going? Is Israel, is that, is that the decision? We want to now annex? the West Bank, we want to now build on private Palestinian land. But at the same time, Netanyahu says he's in favor of a two-state solution. He does want to give the Palestinians a state. So I think we, we're sending confused messages. So how do I, where's the innovation that I think we have when it comes to our high tech, where we have when it comes to our weapons? We might be lacking a bit of that innovation when it comes to, and that creativity of what we want for the grand vision of the country. Now with that said, I don't want to 
be too pessimistic. But I think that the, the, the major political uh, change here will be when those decisions are made. Now, we could keep on going where we are today. Prime Minister Netanyahu has done an amazing job at maintaining and retaining power for now eight years running. And when you look on the horizon, let's put aside for one second these investigations that are against him. We'll see what happens. But he has proven to be quite tenacious in his uh, political career until now. But putting aside the, the criminal investigations, which potentially could bring him down, where does he want to go? What, 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 where's, where is he taking Israel? And I think that that's something that we don't yet have a clear answer on. Right. Is it possible to think about Israeli politics post BB? Meaning, what, what will the post BB era look like? Is there a clear successor? I don't successor? even know how to think about that. Is, is, there, there, <laughs> is there anyone on the horizon who has a different vision of Israeli poli political life, political strategy, who's a plausible successor to Netanyahu? There's a lot of people. Right, within the Likud, you have anyone from Gilad Erdan to the Israeli ambassador to the UN, Dani Danone, who's here and could potentially one day return. You have uh, Gidon Saar, who's a former education minister, interior minister, who left the Likud, who could potentially come back. You have Yar Lapid, who's growing in the polls now, the head of Yesh Atid. You have Naftali Bennett, who's sitting on the outside, who would one day love to join Likud and take over. You have people. Labor, unfortunately, does not have the, the leadership today that could lead to uh, uh, a win in, in the polls. I don't think Herzog has what it takes at the moment, or the, at least the public doesn't view him in that way. But I think there will be a day after. I, I think that for some reason there's something that's happened to Israelis also, is that they can't imagine the day after Bibi. You talk to Israelis and they say, but, but how alternative? Right? What's the alternative? They can't think about what the alternative is. And I think it'll be OK. right? But there are people, there are qualified people, some more than others. Uh, I have my personal opinions, but they don't m make a difference here. But I think that the, the post-BB era will, will one day come, whether we like it or not. And there's, there's what to prepare for. There are, there are challenges that Israel faces. Now, it could go any which way. Right? If you have a very far-right government that suddenly comes to power, they decide to annex all of the West Bank, decide to create a one-state solution, that will go in one direction. If you have a left-wing government or even a center government that comes to power and decides to engage the Palestinians in negotiations and give them a Palestinian state, we'll go in a different direction. But I think that right now we don't have clarity on exactly who wants what and who wants to go where. Well, maybe the next book will be on Israeli biotechnology and keeping BB <laughs> going for three or four more decades. <laughs> so uh, I want to ask one more question and then we'll open it up. This is a book that tells the story of many heroic Israeli individuals um, through the force often of their own individual creativity and will and persistence uh, made big breakthroughs that became essential for Israel. Was there a particular individual that you wrote about that you thought was most heroic or most admirable or that you just found their story to be most powerful as a kind of microcosm for the larger Israeli story? There's a lot of those stories. There are a lot of these people. Uh, I'll pick one. I have to pick one. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll tell you, when I sat with Shimon Peres for a few hours, and, and he told us his story, it was, it was really it was a story that, that blew my mind. Because it was a man who had no military training, who what, didn't even really serve in the IDF but who was chosen for a task because he was believed by Ben-Gurion to be the kind of guy who could go to uh, cocktail parties at night, but then later in the evening roll up his sleeves, go to the docks, and load arms containers onto ships that would then bring them to Israel. But you saw by him really a man with a vision. right? The story of the Demona, the nuclear reactor, which was really his work, without a doubt. The alliance with France. That, it, that Paris was able to establish back in the 1950s. I think the way I kind of summed up Shimon Paris was where others saw peril, Shimon Paris saw opportunity. And he was someone who was able to look at situations that others saw gloom and doom and say, no, we can actually do this or we can do that. So I think that when you, you go back to a lot of these stories, you talk to some of the officers, you talk to some of the generals today, they'll even take you back to Shimon Peres. They'll say what, what, what Peres did back then, what Peres, he laid the groundwork. You know, Israel was the 
first military in the world to create a science corps back in, in the 1950s, right? We, we, we had a corps in the army that we were recruiting soldiers to do science, right? This was Paris's doing, and I think that that together with a lot of this, this gung-ho culture that he really imper he, he embodied to a large extent in his early years um, is, is, is something of a hero in this book. So let's open it up um, to questions. Taking the current military state of Israel and Iran, does Israel have the capability to either stop their nuclear program or delay it for a sufficient amount of time? I believe that Israel does. But w w let's define, let's break down for a moment what it means to take out Iran's nuclear facilities. Iran studied very carefully the 1981 bombing of the Osirak reactor. In 2007, Israel again struck a nuclear reactor in northeastern Syria called the Al-Kibar reactor, a story that still is very much untold because Israel holds it as a very closely guarded secret. But Israel is the only country in the world to not once but twice take out nuclear reactors that were being built by its enemies. So there are, you have to break it up into two different categories. A is there the military capability, and B is there the political will to do it. So let's put political will aside for a moment. When it comes to military capability, Iran dispersed its facilities throughout the country. Some of them we might not even know about where they might be. But if we look at their main facilities, you have Natanz, the main uranium enrichment facility, uh, Qom, which is Fordo, which was built into a mountain, which was discovered uh, back in 2009. That's another facility that they have to enrich uranium. They have Iraq, which is the heavy water facility. A lot of this has changed under the Iran deal. But Israel has the capability, I believe, to set back Iran's nuclear program, to delay it. I can tell you that when you go back to 2012, I remember being in a, in a meeting with some Air Force officers back in 2012, and they were literally showing us on the maps, right? Where they go, how they do it, what squadron does what. Now, never came to that, thankfully. But you have to keep in mind is, okay, so you strike, and you delay, and you cause damage. What happens next? You don't, you don't erase the knowledge. The scientific knowledge exists. So, you need international legitimacy to continue the strikes, to keep on delaying them. Or you need to have America or someone else on your side for them to do it. Right? So it's not just an in and out that it's all over. Uh, that would make things simple. And I think that if that were to have been the case, it would have been Israel might have attacked a long time ago. But this was extremely complicated because of the dispersion, but also because of the international legitimacy that you would have required to be able to keep on attacking or enforce major sanctions that would prevent them from being able to rebuild it. Other questions? The question was, um, in recent years, there's been criticism of Israel by departing intelligence chiefs. So you had, for example, uh, the name, what was the name of that movie? Um, Gatekeepers. Gatekeepers. Gatekeepers, I'm thinking the Shomer Asaf in Hebrew was the name. But gatekeepers of the heads of the Shin Bet, the Shabak, who came out and uh, were very critical of Israel's policies when it comes to the West Bank, but also heads of the Mossad, like Mayor Dagan, for example, who stepped down a number of years ago, who was very critical of Netanyahu. Sometimes it baffles me. I don't, I don't have a good, necessarily a very good answer for you. I've wondered myself, you know, what do they see that others don't see necessarily? What is it that they're experiencing that some of us don't experience that makes them, compels them to leave their positions and say these things that make it seem like we're being run by a government that has no responsibility, that is irrational, that is reckless. Uh, I think that it's a combination of political aspiration, that a lot of these people leave office and they have this feeling that they can do better, and there is that political aspiration in there. But I think it's also a, a feeling in the sense that yes, when, when these people are in these positions, they see things from a different perspective that some of us might not see. When you're the head of the Shabak and you're the one who's enforcing the policies of Israel and the West Bank, the occupation, if we'll call it that, gets to you at some point, apparently. And it makes you rethink what the right steps are. But again, I think that with all due respect to those people, the government is the, are the elected officials in Israel. We're a democracy. We're not run by uh, a bunch of security officers, and I have the utmost respect for them. 
but we're run, but we elect our officials, they're the ones who decide and dictate our policy. We could agree with them or we, we, we don't have to agree with them. But we have a very clear process for getting rid of them and that's called elections, right? So as long as we decide to keep on reelecting one particular individual or different parties, that's where we make our decisions and that's how we change things in Israel. The history of the Middle East is that no Middle Eastern country really has ever produced, other than Israel, any serious weapon capability, whether it's the Egyptians, the Iraqis, the Jordanians, the Syrians, the Lebanese. All of it had to be bought from the Russians at some point or another. The Persians, the Iranians, are a great empire a large number of people are highly intelligent people, highly scientific. And they, for the first time right now, have just received an enormous sum of money from the US, the ability to do things technologically beyond nuclear capabilities that have never been produced before by anyone else. How much of a threat is Iran in terms of its being able to truly be a countervailing force in terms of producing very high-end technological <coughs> achievements. Yes, maybe with the help of the Russians, but nevertheless gapping <laughs> what people today think is possible. Iran is we tend to get caught up when thinking about Iran, we think about the nuclear program. But Iran today is the root of all evil when it comes to the Middle East, when it comes possibly to the entire world. Their support for terrorist organizations in places like Yemen, in places like uh, Hezbollah and Lebanon, Syria where they're supporting the regime of Bashar al-Assad, Hamas and Gaza, but also not just support financial, which they could also use that money to increase the budget. They're already giving about a billion dollars to Hezbollah annually. They're providing Hamas with tens of millions as well, and Islamic Jihad. But they have a very impressive military industry. Their in military complex is also very sophisticated. You look at, for example, at papers that are published today in physics and in advanced mathematics. The Iranians are one of the leading countries out there, even bypassing Israel in some instances. So th they are a formidable opponent beyond, way beyond the nuclear problem and that nuclear challenge. At the same time, I think you're right. You look at Israel, you know, you look at the Syrians. What do they have? Everything is Soviet Russian. <laughs> you look at uh, Egypt, now it's American, used to be Russian. The Iranians, they have their own drones that they make. It's called the Ababil, that's one type of drone. It's pretty impressive. They've been able, they've given it to Hezbollah. They fly, those are the ones that they fly. They've flown a couple of times into Israel. So their ballistic missiles are made in-house. They're domestic. And let's remember, in 1987, Israel became the eighth country in the world to launch a satellite into space. Until then, just superpowers. China, the Soviets, uh, the United States, the French, Jap the Japanese, India. In 2005, Iran launched a, a satellite into space called OMID, HOPE. Right? This is an arms race that we, we, we can't forget. They, they, they did that on their own. No one came to their assistance there. They might have some technological help. They got some missiles originally from the Russians. But that now they've launched a number of satellites into space. So we have to be a step ahead of them, but they're very impressive with their capabilities. And that influx of cash will definitely assist them in that. So just the second part of that question, doesn't that imply that there is a conflict that has to happen irrespective of the, the nuclear part? These are, this is in some form or another Sparta and Athens. They each have some strength versus the other. <coughs> but there is, they are coming, they're going to really come into conflict. It isn't that Israel has something so much more superior unless it's the United States. But that conflict is already being played out, I would argue. The conflict between Israel and Iran is the conflict that we have between 
Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon. They, we, they might be in Lebanon, they might be called Hezbollah, but they're Iranian. And when we're fighting against Hamas today, Israel bomb targets in the Gaza Strip after there was a rocket that was fired into Israel, they're Iranian, right? These are Iranian proxies that are sitting along Israel's borders, supported and funded by Iran, pr provided not just funding, but also inspired by this ideology to destroy Israel. When they launched a ballistic missile, what was it, a week ago, and they called to wipe Israel off the map. This is, this is, this is a war that's already taking place. So could it become something bigger one day? Could it become, become something of a bigger magnitude? Of course it could. I, I would hope that we would find a way to avoid that conflict. And I think that, they, that, that we have deterrence. Let's not forget, we have impressive capabilities. Uh, it always goes back whenever I would think about the nuclear program or the nuclear threat. We also are believed to have nuclear weapons. So they use those against, they use theirs against us, we use ours against them. You know, is, is that what it's going to come down to? But can you live with that little chance that they, even though we deter them, maybe there's a 5 or 10 percent chance they would use a nuclear weapon one day? Can Israel live with that sword over its head at all times? I don't know. But that war is already taking place, it's on our border. Hezbollah today is a, is a, going to be that war that will come, unfortunately, one day. That will be a bad war, right, against Hezbollah. And, and that's an Iranian proxy. Kylie, you have the next question? I actually want to ask a little bit about the, the last administration. Uh, many people hold the opinion that it wasn't uh, the friendliest relations with Israel, and I don't know whether that came from just the broad relationship with Bibi, uh, personally with Obama, uh, but the case that uh, the Obama administration and their supporters would make is essentially uh, we're the best friends that Israel ever had and we just gave them $38 billion and we kept up the, the best military cooperation between, I imagine, the, the general staffs or whatever the cooperation was. So can you speak to the I guess the public uh, uh, for the for the public, what has been said, and then was it really the best friend that Israel ever had? Was there any in the, in the culture, in other words, uh, that you had mentioned versus the rigid bureaucracy and then kind of the free thinking? Was there any tension within uh, the Israeli uh, military establishment? I think that even during the eight years of Obama, America was Israel's best friend. With that said, there was a conscious decision that was taken by the previous administration, they didn't hide it, to create daylight between Israel and the United States. Right? I think Netanyahu said it, uh, said it in a, you know, possibly in a, in, in a very uh, effective way recently when he said to John Kerry around 2334, the resolution that was passed at the UN Security Council, you don't take your friends to the United Nations Security Council. But that was the decision that was made by the administration. Now, with that said, and there was a tense and a rocky relationship between Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Obama, and a lot of that played out in pictures and images and speeches and, and stories that we've all read and heard about. But with that said, you're right. There was amazing, at the same time, there, there, were, two there were two kind of processes that were playing. There was the political relationship that was tense and rocky. We were getting slammed every time there was some settlement announcement. But at the same time, the military cooperation was taking off in unprecedented ways. So how do you explain the discrepancy between the two? And I think that that's what it comes down to. Ultimately, America and Israel are the best of friends. And you could have these differences of opinion, and you could have these, um, these, these honest conversations between the sides. But what, what, what I want to highlight, though, is the president, President Obama, made, made this decision not just, not just to create daylight between Israel and the United States, but also the way I view it, to disengage from the Middle East. The, the red lines that he set down in Syria that were crossed and crossed and crossed and nothing ever happened created a vacuum of power, a vacuum in the Middle East that was filled recently by the Russians. Right? Russia is not just coincidentally in Syria. They moved into Syria because they saw that America is not proactive. America's not involved. Now that's not to Israel's benefit. 
we might have okay relations with Putin and Netanyahu who travels to Moscow every once in a while and it seems like we have what do they call it the deconfliction mechanism that we've created that was a new word I learned deconfliction between is the Israeli Air Force and the Syrians in case their MIGs come close to our borders and we know that they're not about to attack so we created this there's actually this is astounding. In the, Israel, in the uh, Kirya, the military headquarters in Tel Aviv, there's what's known as the bore. Basically, literally, is the pit. It's an underground command center, hundreds of feet underground, fortified its own uh, air purification system. Inside there, 24-7, sits an Israeli officer, a Russian-speaking uh, officer, with a phone that has a direct line to Latakia, right? where, uh, sorry, to Tartus. Tartus is the port city where the Russians are. So there's a direct line. Would you ever have imagined a direct line between the Kiryan Tel Aviv to a Syrian city where there's another Russian sitting on the other side? But put that aside for a moment. That created this vacuum. Now, what else did it create, though? Maybe this is a, uh, the, the, maybe the upside. Israel today has unprecedented relations with the Gulf states. Now, the prime minister will tell you that this is done and they recognize that Israel's not the problem and we're not, we're not the source of instability. And I think that if we go back a few years ago, people used to think if you just solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, world peace will break out, right? But if recent years show us anything, the Arab, so-called Arab Spring, the upheaval, the fighting in Syria, what happened in Libya, what's going on in Lebanon, the overthrowing of uh, Mubarak, Morsi, et cetera, and Egypt's got nothing to do with us. But what this vacuum created in the Middle East, by America not being involved, brought Israel and the Gulf states closer. I recently heard a story, and I, I wrote this in the paper, about how uh, so the, the Gulf, some of the Gulf states are now fighting in Yemen against the Houthis, which are being supported by Iran. Um, a few months ago, they received intelligence about an Iranian armed ship that was setting sail from Iran to, uh, there's a port, Bandar Abbas, which is the main, one of the main ports in the Red Sea. And not the Red Sea, sorry. They, they, they yeah, the, the, they're, they're to set sail to Yemen to supply them with weapons. And they call up America. They pass on this intelligence information. Day goes by, two days go by. The ship is still sailing. Nothing happens. They call up Israel. Within a day, the ship turns around and goes back to port. So we've reached a situation where the Gulf states are turning to Israel for help with Iran. Because you had a reality where you had this vacuum that was created by an administration that made its decision. It's its right to make those decisions. But now we will we have these repercussions. What will happen now? I don't know. Um, question is, what will the finding of natural gas mean to the situation in the Middle East? Israel's discovery of these natural gas fields, the economic impact, the military impact, and the geopolitical impact? First of all, I think it's a blessing from God that we did not find the natural gas 60 years ago. Because imagine had we found natural gas 60 years ago, the culture of innovation, the startup nation that we have today would never have been created. Because we would have relied on this natural resource that we have. And we would have had to be creative and be innovative and think out of the box and come up with drip irrigation and, and different technologies to be able to succeed in the world. And that's where we've made a name for ourselves. So we should be thanking God that we're only, we've only discovered it in recent years. Now what can it do? First of all, let's see that it starts to come out. Right? We've got to get it out of the water. And we, there's, we spoke about the bureaucracy before, Eric. Uh, this bureaucracy has been upholding um, the ability to drill in some of the places. One has already Tamar, but there's Leviathan, which is another big field which uh, they haven't even really started in a big way to, to extract the gas. It has the ability, A, to potentially lower the cost of living within Israel, to go back into the Israeli education system, to go back into the Israeli economy. It has the ability to spin off new types of economies and industries that today don't exist within Israel and make Israel a place not just known for its high-tech ways and mobile eye and autonomous driving, but also when it comes to energy and make Israel an energy superpower. But I think you're right also when it comes to geopolitics, it could give Israel the ability to forge new alliances. I think we, we have to look at the, the uh, recent um, 
reestablishment of ties between Jerusalem and Ankara, Israel and Turkey, within that pr context, right? The fact that we reinstated ambassadors in both countries is an understanding the Turks need energy. They want to be part of that. The Greeks are coming. Prime Minister Netanyahu who has done a, a fine job, a good job, creating an, an alliance with uh, Greece and Cyprus when it can mainly around that issue of the, oil, of the gas and of the energy. So this could be a potential game changer. We've already struck a deal with Jordan. Israel would be providing Jordan with gas. The Egyptians want gas as well, and that's a likely easy natural customer. They're to our south, why not sell to them? So this could help you establish ties, develop diplomatic ties, reinforce them, but also project power, right? Diplomatic clout far into Asia and to Europe, and that could be of great importance for Israel. If Iran is the head of all the money and, and support of all the terrorists, what do you think would happen if the Palestinians would get their country, the West Bank? It would be worse than Gaza being with Hamas. Now you will have the, the, the Iranians sitting there uh, right by Bengolian airport with all their power and smarts. This is the primary concern, and this is the, one of the main reasons why a Palestinian state has yet to be established, because of this concern of what happens when Israel withdraws. You look at throughout history, you look at Israeli withdrawals from places like Lebanon in 2000, Hezbollah grew in a, in a tremendous way to the war of 2006, and they continue to grow. You look at Israel's withdrawal from Gaza in 2005. People, I spoke about Shimon Peres before, but Shimon Peres was the same guy who said that Gaza is going to turn into the Singapore of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. It turned into a hell on earth, right? To an Afghanistan, if we could call it that. So you, you, you think about, now go convince Israelis that it's in their strategic interest to withdraw from another piece of territory, one where its borders will shrink and become even more narrow. With that said, when you look at Israel's strategic standing today in the Middle East, we are a powerful country. We are in a point in time where I believe, and maybe I'm naive, that we have never been stronger. We spoke about the gas economically, our high tech sector. We have problems, we have gaps within society like many different countries and economies, but we, we weathered, for example, the 2008 storm. We are now tapping into new pools of talent with the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, the Arab women, for example. We're increasing their workforce participation. But look at, our, their, look at our military threats. As bad as Hezbollah is with 130,000 rockets, I would argue they can't conquer a single kibbutz along the border with Lebanon. They can terrorize us. They can cause a lot of damage and destruction. Hamas can terrorize with their rockets and their tunnels. They can carry out mass casualty attacks by tunneling into a kibbutz, kill dozens of people. Horrific. But they can't conquer that kibbutz. They won't be able to hold on to it. Excuse me? What if Russians join them? I don't. Uh, what if Russians but join It's them? enough that one second. would be an my, 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 my point I is, know. my point is, is that, is that today, when you look at the conventional military threats against Israel, there's no longer a Syrian military to speak of that could potentially invade Israel. Egypt we have peace with. Jordan we have peace with. So we're at a point in time where we are strong. Now, the threats exist. But you also have to use your power. You have to take advantage of an opportunity to take steps, sometimes bold steps, towards peace, potentially. Does that mean that you're willing to give up everything? Does that mean, for example, that you're willing to pull out of the Jordan Valley? Prime Minister Netanyahu, who has endorsed a two-state solution and in his famous Bar Ilan speech of 2009, speaks about a demilitarized state and a state that Israel still retains control of the Jordan Valley to prevent the formation of a front, of an eastern front for Israel, which would allow Iraq, Iran, all these other countries to potentially come into Israel. There are major threats. The threats will always be there. But we also, you have to take a long-term strategic perspective. And I think that today, where Israel is, militarily in a security perspective, and our standing, I don't think there's ever been a point in time that we've been stronger than we are today. The day before yesterday, I read the New York Times review of your book, and I think they raised one interesting point, which I'd like a few points. But the question is, 
to what extent do you think there's a moral problem with Israel being known as the uh, sixth largest arms producer and merchant and the largest producer of uh, weapons like uh, drones, which are used uh, for targeted killings? Do you think that has a moral dimension, or do you think it's just no valueless as far as morality goes? No, I think. I'll tell you the cliche that you've probably heard countless times. There's no military more moral than the IDF. But I honestly believe that. And as someone who serves in the Army, who continues to serve in reserves, what I've seen shows me that the consideration and the value for civilian life, not just within Israel, but also among our enemies, is unheard of, is unprecedented. The, you know, just about the, the, the New York Times a review, I was called a chair, we were called cheerleaders by, by the New York Times, cheerleaders of Israel. I personally wear that as a badge of honor, to be a cheerleader of my country. But, but with that said, I also have criticism, right? And I think that's our job as journalists and as a newspaper to serve as a watchdog and to, and to criticize our country when needed. But when it comes to the military, I want to tell you just one story which I think really encapsulates this moral standing that Israel has. People have asked me over the years, you know, why don't you just carpet bomb Gaza, for example? Why don't you just deal with the threat that way? Now, that's something that obviously Israel wouldn't do. But go back to Operation Cast Lead in 2008, 2009, the first big operation that Israel launched into Gaza after the withdrawal of 2005. It gathered, it dropped flyers to warn people to flee their homes. It gathered all the phone numbers and the cell phone numbers because then it would find out that there's a building or a home that their Hamas has storing a launcher or an arms cache and they want to bomb it. So they call up the home and they say, leave the home. For about 45, 46 times it worked. People got the phone call, they left, they bombed the home. And by the way, legitimate military target, according to international law, there are two tests that you have to evaluate when it comes to bombing a civilian target at a time of war. One, does it have a military, has it now been used for military application? So if the Tikva building were to suddenly store arms and have a Hamas command center inside, I don't think Roger would allow that to happen. But <laughs> don't be so sure. <laughs> if that were to one day happen, so number one is yes, a civilian facility has now become a military facility. That's test one. But test two is proportionality. If by bombing this building are is does are you potentially killing more civilians? And you have, to weigh, you have to weigh that question. So when Hamas established a bunker under Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, and Israel knew that that's where Jabri and all of his deputies were leading the wars against Israel, of course you're not going to bomb a hospital, right? But going back to the bombing of these homes, so the 45th, 46th time, they call up the home, they don't leave. They climb to the roof. They know that there are drones hovering above, transmitting images back to Tel Aviv, and they wave up. They don't know what to do. They decide, okay, we're not going to bomb. Again, tomorrow, the next day, they call up the home. They say, leave the home. They again climb to the roof. So they come up with this idea, to make a long story short, they develop a munition. They fire it into the corner of the roof. Doesn't have any, there's, the dispersion of fr shrapnel is minimal. No one gets hurt, but the people think, oh my God, Israel's really crazy. Even though we're on the roof, they're going to bomb. And they leave, they flee the home, and then Israel bombs the home. They know what they call this tactic in Israel? Knocking on the roof. And they use this countless times throughout war. Now, you say to yourself, why do you have to do that? You got five, six, ten people in a home with Hamas rockets, with the Hamas command center. These are enemies. Why are we doing something like this? Why are we wasting our time? I think that's called a supreme level of morality and ethics that you see that, uh, I don't know that you can find that in other places. Look at the, the recent trial of the soldier Elor Azaria. Very controversial. Split the state of Israel. This is the, who's known as the Hebron shooter. Came to the scene of a terrorist attack 11 minutes after this attacker had already been neutralized, had been shot, was lying on the street of, of in Hebron, and shot him in the head for no reason, it seemed, has been convicted, right? Convicted of manslaughter in Israel by a, by a military court. He'll likely go to jail. Now, we could have whitewashed that. We could have swept that under the rug. Do, do, do you see the, the, the amount, I mean, today, public opinion, when it comes to the IDF, 
the IDF, the People's Army, that has held itself always to be something that is uncontested, is, is bipartisan. The military is the, 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 you know, the sacred cow that you know, no one will touch. But here, suddenly, people are against the IDF. There are demonstrations on the streets of Tel Aviv against the army because of this moral superiority, I think. So I believe that you know, while there's criticism in the New York Times, that's very nice. I appreciate that. But ultimately, I think that the, the IDF really is, and I'll go back to that, that cliche, is, is possibly the most moral military in the world. Do you, do you think that um, perhaps this bending, I call it bending over backwards, you know, just being too good, like my grandmother would say, too good is no good. Anyway, is because we're so in need of public opinion and the aid of the United States that we have to kind of cringe? You know, I th it's a great question. I think it's a combination of a number of, 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 uh, of factors. Number one, is that Israel as a state, Israel as a people, and maybe this has to do with the fact our diverse population, the fact that Israelis, many of them come from European countries, Ashkenazi descent, they come from countries where they were part of the, in some cases, the elite, part of the uh, uh, a valued part of society. And they came to a country and they also, they want to be accepted. Israelis yearn for acceptance. Israel as a country yearns for acceptance and sometimes that works against us. But I believe, my opinion, is that this is one of the basic principles and fundamentals of what it means to be a Jew, right? We value life. You read the Torah, you read the Bible, and it talks about how we sanctify life, we protect life. Ushmartem et nafshotechem, right? Protect your, your souls, protect your bodies, protect your lives. You look at our enemies, and it's exactly the opposite. So when you, you, you look at the discrepancy between who we fight against and how we fight, now you could say, maybe we need to change. I think that would be a dangerous day. I think that we have to hold to our morals and to our values. That's what makes us unique. That's what makes us special. Can I just, as a corollary to that, um, the, uh, getting back to the film, The Gatekeepers, I just saw it and I was seething. And then I read, and I, I would like to know your opinion on how much truth there is to that, that some of those people that badmouthed Israel, the Mossad people, and whoever, were paid <coughs> off. Do you think there's any truth to that? I, I don't believe they were paid off, and I think that we have to look at it in the context of this is the beauty of Israeli democracy is that we have people who will serve their country for decades, protect us on a daily basis, but yes, then they leave office and they have the ability to speak up. Now, let's imagine for a moment, in Saudi Arabia, the head of the intelligence apparatus leaves office and decides to criticize King Salman. Let's imagine that the head of the Muhabarat in Egypt decides to leave office and criticize President al-Sisi. These people's heads would be chopped off. In Israel, I think we should value the fact that, yes, it's criticism, it makes us upset, we wonder where it comes from, but I think it's something that we uphold as part of what it means to be a Jewish democracy. A democracy is one thing, but a Jewish democracy is a state where people have many opinions that they feel the right to voice freely, and that's a nation, that's a country that I would be, want to be a part of. So, <clears throat> we haven't addressed the elephant in the room, which is, how do you think that things are going to go forward with the current <clears throat> the, uh, the current administration is the, uh, is the elephant in the room, I guess. But, you know, I'll tell you just one story from this past Thursday night. So we have my uh, Washington bureau chief, Michael Wilner, had been after, had been trying to get the administration to comment on Israel's settlement announcements over the past few weeks. <coughs> Israel announced 3,000 new housing units and 2,000 new housing units. Then Netanyahu said after the demolition of Amona that we'll build a new settlement, which is something unheard of. Since the 90s, Israel hasn't spoken about building new settlements. And the administration here, quiet. Silence, not a word. So different <laughs> than what we've had in the past, right? Um, Suddenly, I get a phone call from him. I was still in, in, at work. Uh, it was Thursday night, so that's our big paper. It comes out Friday. That's our weekend paper. <clears throat> and um, he calls at about 9 p.m. our time, so that's 2 p.m. here. And he says, Yaakov, I've got a, an official statement by the administration in the name of an, an unnamed a senior administration official. 
It wasn't given to him by phone. It wasn't like he spoke to somebody. It was given to him by email, sent to him by three different officials, CC'd on this email, contrary to people who then accused the Jerusalem Post of spreading fake news, um, which criticized the, uh, basically slammed Israel and warned Israel. I headline that we went up with at 4 p.m. Eastern time was Trump warns Israel stop announcing new settlements. And in that statement, they talk, spoke about how Israeli announcements are undermining the president's policies, are undermining the ability to potentially reach a two-state solution, that the president is, supports a two-state solution, that the president uh, has set this as one of his goals, completely different than anything we've heard of until now. Two hours later, this thing blows up like fire, right? We're accused, of course, of fake news. And two hours later, Sean Spicer, the press secretary, issues a statement that's completely different, <laughs> right? Watered down, talks about how settlements are not an obstacle to peace. Israel can continue to build within existing settlements, not go beyond the current borders of settlements. So basically, I understand that to mean that you could take a, you could even in outside the blocks, right, in some of the isolated settlements, break, demolish your home and build a 15-foot apartment building, right? <laughs> um, you could do that. Uh, but. It's not helpful, they said, okay, but President and the Prime Minister will talk about this in their meeting next week. So what happened in those two hours, right? <laughs> I think that we have to wait and see. My reading of the situation is that they're still getting their footing. They don't know exactly yet what they're doing when it comes to some of these very complicated issues, right? You have a president who could have his Secretary of State work on a, a peace process with Israel and the Palestinians for two years, and then suddenly within one tweet, just throw all that down the drain, right? So I think that we have to, the, the sensitivities, now the second statement that came out that seemed watered down, that you can build within borders, everyone's like, oh, you know, they're, they're like, they're doing the Rashi commentary on the wording. Because we're used to so much of interpreting what this word means and what this term is and what's the con this concept. I don't think they're, they're, they're at that stage yet. So, uh, so that's number one. Number two is the celebrations that we've seen in Israel, especially among the far right of Trump is the Messiah, right? <laughs> this is, the, this is, this is a, the reset. Yes, it's a reset. Yes, the tone is different. The fact that we're not condemned every time we do something <coughs> changes the atmosphere. But I think Trump has shown, President Trump has shown that he's transactional in the way he does business, but also in the way he does foreign policy. So to think that he's just going to give Israel the embassy in Jerusalem and just say to Israel, no more Palestinian state, build as much as you'd like. Let's assume, by the way, I don't even think Netanyahu wants that, okay, but that's a separate issue. And not to expect anything in return. So let's, I think we really have to wait to see how this all plays out. It's still early to see. Next week, the Prime Minister comes to Washington, meets the President. It'll be interesting, that's for sure. As, a, as an editor of a newspaper, one thing makes me happy is I will never have a problem filling the news pages on a daily basis, <laughs> that's for sure. Yakov, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.